And the word for that, the ability to have these things, to have John Milton's poetry, uh, to have Philip Larkin's uh, poem Church Going, to have uh, Shakespeare to have, without the superstition, is called culture, on which we've all laid our lives, on which we've all sworn to defend ourselves and our civilization against, especially now, precisely against religious barbarism, against those who know they are right, against those who say they only need one book, against those who say they know God's on their side, against those who say there's a revelation. That's what culture is, that's what we're defending. Yes, we'd be better off with culture, and yes, we can have it without religion, which is a mind-forged manacle. Thanks. Religionists and um, evangelicals say to me, but you don't understand, we have a mission for you. You need to be saved. You must accept Jesus Christ or you cannot be saved. What shall I answer them? God, well, I mean, the second bit of the question is very easy to answer. I mean, uh, tell her to fuck off. <laughs> Here's the situation. <clears throat> if the Nazarene preacher from Galilee ever really existed, um, there's no question who he met. He met the Jewish people first and came partly from their tradition. If the prophet Muhammad really ever existed, and I doubt both these propositions very much, but to the extent that any narrative about this can be told, the first encounter he had was with, was with people whose first religion was Judaism. The Jews took a look at both these guys and said, no, this is not the Messiah. This is not the Redeemer. We reject them. Do you think it's going to be forgiven? No. Do you think this has led to a huge amount of violence and turmoil and heresy hunting and fascism and genocide? Yes. Do you think it's over yet? Better not believe that. The worst is yet to come. They're never going to forgive it. That's what you get when you set Bronze Age myths in conflict with each other and let civilized people act as if, they're, they're, as if they're for real. That the speaker not only can prove the existence of the said entity, <coughs> but can claim to know this entity's mind. In fact, can claim to know it quite intimately. Can claim to know his or her personal wishes. Can, in turn, tell you what you may do in his name. A, a quite large arrogation of power you will suddenly notice is being granted to the speaker here. The speaker can tell you that he knows, he cannot tell you how, but he can tell you that he knows, for example, that heaven hates ham. That God doesn't want you to eat pork products. He can tell you that God has a very, very strong view about with whom you may have sexual relations, indeed, how you may have sexual relations with others. Uh, he can indicate perhaps a little less convincingly, but no less firmly, that there are certain books or courses of study that you might want to avoid. Now, this suggests to me uh, already a design. I think I can see a design shaping up here, and I think I can see who designed it and created it. I think it was man-made. I think the whole inference, because you can certainly see a design at work, is that this is human. Is it not the case that the spread of Christianity about which you spoke so warmly and affectingly in your opening remarks, attributing it to its in, the innate truth of the Bible story, uh, was spread by that means or because the Emperor Constantine decided to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire? Which, in your view, contributed more to the spread of the faith? Uh, the Holy Spirit. I rest my case. <laughs> Currently, polio is spreading back across the world. We thought we had eradicated it. A lot of very good secular activists and medical physicians went out to do the eradication. I went with them as far as Bengal. Suddenly, religious people started to say, don't take your children in. This is a clot. Okay, don't, God back. doesn't want you to do it. It yeah, only really takes a few uninoculated children, and the disease has spread all the way back across Africa now, okay. thanks to faith and the faith-based. <laughs> if you're going to take credit for all the charitable work, you have to take credit for all the atrocities as well, and it will leave you exactly where you began, with everything still to be explained. What about His Holiness the Pope saying until 1965, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that every Jewish person was collectively guilty of deicide, 
Wasn't that said by the vicar of Christ on earth, the man who held the keys of Peter, who had divine authority? By what right, Rabbi, do you say that you know God better than they do, that your God is better than theirs, that you have an access that I can't claim to have, to knowing not just that there is a God, but to knowing his mind? You put it modestly, but it is a fantastically arrogant claim that you make, an incredibly immodest claim, and if made by a fanatic, or by a bully, or by a murderer, I'll take it to the next stage. And reply directly to Karamazov and Smerdyakov. Isn't it rather the case that with God, anything is permissible? Once someone has said, God told me to do it, what is not allowed? You may be an atheist and wish that there was a God who loved you and took care of you. It's possible, um, but just to decide there isn't enough evidence for it, just as Mr. Jefferson was a deist, uh, but didn't believe in religion. He didn't think God intervened. Uh, these positions are equally compatible. I know several atheists who would happily say that they wish it were true, but that they can't find that it is believable. My own view is that it's uh, very fortunate for us that it isn't true, and I shall say why. The two offers are, um, at that point, as you will know, at least from all the two, two of the leading monotheisms, either an eternity of praise and servility, everlasting praise and adoration of someone who has only done his job by creating you, hasn't been invited to do so, proposition that sounded more like hell to me when I first heard about it, or a very much more unpleasant one, derived not from the Old Testament but from the New, there's no hell in the Old Testament. There's genocide, there's racism, there's slavery, there's child mutilation, there's all, everything else you could wish for, but there's no punishment of the dead, not until the the arrival of the gentle Nazarene is it suggested that for a crime you probably were forced to commit, because after all, you're created a sinner. You're created sick and commanded to be well, the essence of the totalitarian principle. Uh, but for that, you might face an eternity of torture, for, to which there will be no end. Now, I think this is a horrible proposition. I think those who wish for it are wishing for slavery and civility for the abdication of their own responsibility, for the dissolution of their minds, for the abolition of their individuality. I'm therefore very glad to say that there is no evidence for it at all. We can relax.